commissioners burst into flames. Fuse boxes all along via Mare, the village's main thoroughfare, melted. Locks rattled furiously, trying to tear themselves from their doors. Technology seemed to lash out violently against its supposed masters. The manifestations is good. 
Sat on top. 
business associate and a funeral director. It began with Maria's first husband, Douglas Lapine, a retired military officer who died in 1970 after an apparent fall in their house. Her second husband, Thomas Brixen, a retired businessman, died after an stroke just a year after their marriage, and six months after he was allegedly attacked by intruders. Maria's third husband, James Piper, was an American businessman who she met in December of 1988. He had responded to an ad for a rental house just outside of Guadalajara. Within four months, they were married. James's children thought that she was a nice person and would be good for their father. Six months later, on September 18th, 1989, James took Maria out for breakfast. She later told his son Peter that when James didn't come out from the bathroom, she sent a busboy in to check on him. James had keeled over on the floor, apparently suffering from a heart attack. He died a short time later, Peter received a call from the American consulate. The caller said that Maria had a signed document from James that stated that he should immediately be cremated upon his death. Peter thought it was strange because his father was not old and had not made any other plans regarding a funeral. After the cre cremation, Maria invited James's children and they noticed that her behavior was very odd. They felt that she was trying too hard to show emotion. Later, she apparently tried to pit the children against each other in order to get James's possessions. This included two cars worth two million dollars that have since vanished. His children have never received any money from his estate. Maria assumed a low profile. In August of 1993, she reported that her half-sister died. She received $100,000 from a life insurance policy. A few months later, Maria began dating Victor Lapine, no relation to Maria's first husband, Douglas Lapine, a wealthy Montana rancher. In June of 1994, Victor's sister Eva received the shocking news that Victor had died. According to Maria, he had become sick at a restaurant and passed away a few hours later. After his death, she produced his last will and testament. It asked for him to be cremated. Maria also produced a suspicious IOU for $100. Approximate value of Victor's house. His family had Mexican authorities start an investigation. A shocking turn of events occurred when Maria herself supposedly died in March of 1995. Her mother and three children received a $500,000 life insurance policy. The insurance company hired an investigator. Santiago to verify the facts surrounding Maria's death. He later discovered evidence that Maria was actually still alive. In January of 1996, her body was exhumed. All that was found were some flowers, wood, and personal effects. Forensic testing later determined that there was never a body inside. Body of her deceased half sister was also exhumed. It was determined that no body was inside and that the sister did not even exist. She had apparently faked her own death twice. A few days later, before authorities were scheduled to question the funeral director who had arranged both. 
is a fraud charge because it cannot be proven that she murdered any of the nine people. She is believed to be hiding out with her elderly mother and three grown children. They have also been charged with fraud. They may be in San Antonio, Texas. Maria is 5'2", 120 pounds, has black hair, brown eyes, is fluent in English, Spanish, and French, was born on October 15th, 1939, and would now be in her 80s. So, this woman probably murdered nine people, and she could just be out there. She could be dead. She could not. Um, and we don't know for sure what happened. Like, we don't know for sure that she killed them, but, um, yeah. Let me know if you hear my stomach, because it is going nuts today. I, this is just gonna be, like, a stomach growling video, because... It's crazy. Um, but the next country, I think country number four, is it number four? I think it is. Number five. Number five is New Zealand. Around 5 a.m. on October 3rd, 1955, the Joita left Samoa's Apia Harbor. about 270 miles away. The boat had been scheduled to leave on the noon tide the previous day, but her departure was delayed because her port engine clutch failed. The ship eventually left Samoa on one engine. She was carrying 16 crew members and nine passengers, including a government official buyer and two children. Her cargo consisted of medical supplies, timber, 80 empty 45 gallon oil drums, and various foodstuffs. The voyage was expected to take between 41 and 48 hours. On October 6th, a message from the post reported that the ship was overdue. No ship operator reported receiving a distress signal from the crew. A search and rescue mission was launched, and from 6 to 12 of October, rescuers covered a probability area of nearly 100,000 square miles of ocean, but no sign of Joita or any of her passengers or crew was found. later on November 10th, Gerald Douglas, captain of the merchant ship Tuvalu, en route from Suva to Funafuti, sighted Joita more than 600 miles west from her scheduled route. The ship was partially submerged and there was no trace of any of the passengers or crew. Four tons of cargo were also missing. The recovery noted that the radio was discovered tuned to the International Marine Radio Telephone Distress Channel. The ship's logbook and other navigational equipment were gone, along with all three lifeboats and the firearms that were known to be on board. Also, there were some sinister indications of possible the ship's bridge had been smashed, and still on the deck, a 
discovered by a walker near where DuPont had last been spotted, despite intense speculation that the remains belonged to the suspected murderer. DNA analysis proved they belonged to someone else. Nevertheless, the discovery propelled Xavier into the headlines once again, and in July that year, the speculation intensified after a letter signed by someone claiming to be Xavier was sent to journalists. I am still alive was written on the back of what appeared to be a family photo of two of his sons sitting at a table and was sent to an AFP journalist. Whether that letter was indeed sent by Xavier has never been confirmed. So that's kind of a crazy one. <laughs> that, uh, like, we don't even know if he's alive. Like, I don't know. I guess we think that he did it, but we don't actually know if he is alive or if he did it or... Yeah. So, that is kind of crazy. Um, okay, I think I'm just gonna do one more and I'm trying to decide which one to do because my stomach is going crazy and this video is like so chaotic and I don't really want to make it super long if it's just gonna suck, so yeah. Um, but I think we are going to do, going to do this one, which I'm attributing to Poland, but it's like could be anywhere in, somewhere in Europe, um, but yeah. In 1912, Rare Books dealer Wilfred Voynich was rooting through dusty chests of manuscripts in a Jesuit college just outside of Rome. The Jesuits had decided to sell some of their centuries-old collection and had invited him to see if anything might be of interest. I attribute it to Poland because Wojnik, the guy that found it, was Polish, but I guess he found it in Rome, so it could be Italy. I don't know. Um, but yeah. As he explained, Wojnik found, in his own words, an ugly duckling, a manuscript like no other. Turning the pages, his eyes fell on unusual illustrations and mysterious symbols that formed a unique and unreadable script. He immediately recognized its value. Voynich bought the manuscript, and it wasn't long before it excited imaginations across the globe. Today, the Voynich manuscript, as it became known, is kept in Yale University's library. Scholars have pored over its contents for over a century, but no one has managed to understand its meaning. Do the Voynich symbols encipher a known language, or are they the alphabet of an invented one? Is the content 
statistical analysis of the manuscript's unique script have concluded that its content is not gibberish, and a recent study of the handwriting has shown that the text is the work of five scribes, writing in at least two dialects. It appears then that a real language hides behind the symbols. Where the Voynich manuscript was created remains unknown, though Yale University's library catalog cautiously suggests Central Europe as its place of publication, and we still can't read its unique script or identify which language it hides. Unsurprisingly, then, with so much unknown, the Voynich manuscript's purpose is impossible to determine with certainty. For now, the best guess is that it's a work of medical, magical, or scientific thought, but our understanding could change. Scholarly investigations are ongoing and continue to reveal new clues. So I just think that one is kind of cool. It's basically like this manuscript that was found, and it just has all of these symbols and words and things in it, and we have no idea what it means. So it's like some sort of gibberish, and it's not a language that we know, which is pretty cool, right? So again, not a scary mystery, but just something that's really cool. Um, I thought that was cool, but I didn't know what country to attribute it to. Um, I guess it's kind of Italy, because they found the manuscript in Rome, but I don't know. I attributed it to Poland because the guy was Polish. So, yeah. But I think I'm going to stop there. I think I'm going to do the other three mysteries that I have written down on my Patreon. So, I'll put like a part three, I guess, on my Patreon. But I didn't want to make this video too long because my stomach growling kind of ruined it. I don't want the video to be like super, super long if it's just gonna 